Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. Today, we're gonna to be discussing five big small stakes cash game mistakes. And then, at the end of this webinar, I'm gonna be answering your questions. So, let's go ahead and get right to it. I know we have a few new people here who do not know me, so this is me. I'm Jonathan Little. I've cashed for over $7 million in live poker tournaments. I'm the head coach at PokerCoaching.com, where we now have lots of coaches, as well as myself, producing educational content for you. I'm the commentator of many poker shows. I'll be commentating some World Poker Tour streams in the near future. And I'm the author of 14 best-selling poker books. All right. So, it's enough talking about me. Let's talk about one of my students who just sent me this email yesterday. He says, hello, I wanted to share with you a little success. Thanks to all of your coaching, so far this year you've been playing part-time. You've been play you put in 320 hours across one, two, and one, three, no limit. And you're making over $25 an hour. It's pretty solid. Way more than your job. Your bankroll's up to almost $10,000. You hope to move to 2.5 soon and eventually go pro. That is exactly what I am trying to do for all of my students. I'm trying to help them go from being small stakes players who are, you know, trying to win at poker but struggling to players who can make a significant amount of money. And if you're making $25 an hour at 1.2 and 1.3, you can probably build your bankroll to the point where you can play 2.5 like Trent here is doing. And then... You can start making $50 an hour. Then you can move up from there to 510, start making $100 an hour, and then you're making significant money. And I have taught many, many students to do this, and I'm very certain I can do that for you as well. But today, I want to talk about five big mistakes that small stakes players are making. And the first mistake is not figuring out your opponent's strategies. It is vitally important that you figure out what your opponents are doing because poker is not about playing just the two cards you get dealt. So often, when I go and play small stakes games to get experience for my training content and to just make sure everything that I'm doing still works in the, in the real world, I see players playing about as straightforwardly as you can. When they have a good hand, they bet. When they don't have a good hand, they check. And that's clearly not so good. Other players are just lunatics. They don't care what your opponent, their opponents are doing. They don't realize some players are just going to be trapping them very hard, right? They're just blasting away. And you want to make sure that you are figuring out what your opponents do wrong. So you cannot expect to be able to blindly follow some simple system and show an immediate profit. Poker is a relatively difficult game, believe it or not. It's a good thing that it is because if it was easy, there'd be no money to make in it. Kind of like you see a game like tic-tac-toe, right? There are no professional tic-tac-toe players because it's easy. And you'll find that in general, the games that are more difficult, but also have um, chance in there to sort of deceive people of their skill levels, uh, those are games you can make a significant amount of money from long-term. And that is exactly what poker is. So anyway, you need to pay attention to your opponent's strategies. And that means actually paying attention at the poker table. So many people don't pay attention. They're playing on their phones or they're watching sports. And look, I realize that it's a, it may feel a little bit difficult for you to go to the casino and actually pay attention the whole time that you were there. And that's just what you have to do if you want to succeed long term. All right, the next mistake is once you figure out that you need to be paying attention, a lot of people fail to take advantage of what their opponents are doing incorrect. So many players know what their opponents are doing incorrectly, but they either don't know or don't know how, or they're just afraid to adjust, right? And you have to be willing to adjust. So when you see your opponent making a mistake, you want to figure out what you can do to take advantage of that mistake. So don't just say, all right, this person bluffs too much. Figure out what to do about it. And... Uh, let, let's give you an example of that real quick. So here's a hand that was sent in to me this morning where, come on computer, there it goes. We have a raise to $7 from early position. We're playing one, two, and then we pick up pocket tens in, whoops, where did it go? 
computer's not functioning properly. We'll get there. We pick up pocket tens in the hijack seat, all right? So what do we do with tens? This is a very easy call in my mind. Pretty much no matter who your opponent is. In this scenario, if your opponent's like an absolute lunatic, perhaps you can just re-raise and be happy playing a big pot. You can just re-raise straight up for value. But in general, you're going to want to just call with hands like pocket tens, nines, eights, sevens, stuff like that. Stuff that flops well enough. And middle pairs flop pretty well. You're either going to make a hand like a set, which is great, or an overpair, which is great, or an underpair, which is not so great. So we're just going to flop, um, call, see the flop. I think this is all great so far. Flop comes ace, ace, jack. At this point, you want to ask, do I have a premium made hand, which will be an ace or better? No, clearly not. Do we have a draw? Obviously not. Do we have a marginal made hand? We do. If this hand checks down, you know, we actually win a decent amount of the time. Or do we have junk? Well, our tens multi-way is somewhere between a marginal made hand and junk. And with marginal made hands and junk, you essentially always want to be checking. There's no point in betting right now because if we bet, what's going to call us? Well, good draws are going to call us, which have plenty of equity. Or an ace or jack is going to call, which we're dead against. So there's absolutely no purpose in betting on this flop. The person who sent me this hand this morning does elect to check. Turn comes a 10. And now, under the gun, bets $10, a relatively small bet. So at this point, pocket 10s is just the best hand almost every time. We're really only losing to slow played ace jack, pocket jacks, and ace 10. So should we raise? And I think the answer is probably yes. In this scenario, if we are against an ace, an ace will very clearly call. Most likely, when the opponent bets $10 in this scenario, they're going to have a lot of marginal made hands like pocket kings, maybe ace two type hands, maybe something like king jack, maybe king queen, but I think king queen will want to bet bigger. Typically, you're going to find that most people want to be betting bigger whenever they have their strong hands, their strongest hands, like king queen here. That said, some players will just bet small with everything. And again, you need to figure out what they're doing wrong, right? This is a very hypothetical hand. Again, this is just what someone emailed me. So I don't know what the opponents are specifically doing incorrectly. So in this scenario, I think we do want to raise. And we don't want to raise too big because if we raise big, what's going to happen is the opponent is now going to start to fold out hands like King Jack, which is drawing dead, right? Or nearly dead. Um, so we definitely want to keep the opponent in. I think we can maybe raise even a little bit bigger, like 35, but this is fine. Now, the player on the button, cold calls. This right here is an extreme sign of strength. This is almost always going to be a strong made hand, either an ace or straight. If the opponent's a particularly bad player, though, you know, maybe they're calling with King Jack because they think it's good, even though it's obviously not. So right here, this is a spot where... For the first part in this hand, it's really important what the opponents are doing, right? Like if this was a very good player right here, I would not be shocked if their range is legitimately king, queen, and better. And that's it. Because they have to realize when it goes bet for 10, raise to 30, like what do I have? I have an ace or better for value pretty much every time. And I mean, maybe I raise here like queen, nine of clubs, nine, eight of clubs, stuff like that if I don't bet it on the flop. But for the most part... I'm just going to have a really good hand, right? So if I have a really good hand, especially using the small sizing, like this just has to be a really good hand as well. Like what, ace, ace, queen or better, but ace, queen, maybe three bets pre-flop. May, may call, but it's going to be basically ace, queen or better. And that's, um, that's quite telling, right? Now gets back around to under the gun who now re-raises small again. So it went 10, call, or 10, 30, cold call, re-raise to 60. Now alarm bell should be going off. So right now, if you're here, type in what you would do. In this scenario, how do you play these pocket tens? Do we have the super nuts now? Do we have a marginal made hand? Do we have junk? I don't know, right? This is where it becomes very, very important for you to realize that there is no clearly right answer in this scenario, right? Because if under the gun is a knit or a tight player or a straightforward player, this is just a very, very easy fold, a trivially easy fold, right? So that's what you want to do against a strong player because a strong player will literally never re-raise here with king, queen, or worse, which means if they're raising here, they have ace, 10, or better. Well, pocket jacks are better, right? So how do we fare against pocket jacks or better? We're dead. So if we're dead, don't put any more money in the pot, right? Just fold. I know it sounds super nitty, but this is an example of uh, the classic cash game scenario where you want to be betting and applying aggression until it becomes clear your beat. 
And once it becomes clear you're beat, you don't put another chip in the pot. You fold. And right here against a tight, straightforward player, as you will often encounter at 1-2 in a local casino, just fold. Because, think about it, if you call here, what's going to happen on the turn? Or the river? The opponent's going to go all in, right? And if the opponent goes all in, we're in the same spot. You lose to every better hand. And now Jason in the chat brings up the, the best question here. What if the player is bad and they overvalue an ace? That's exactly right. What if the opponent overvalues an ace? What if you're under the gun's going to sit here with like ace four and think ace four is the nuts? Clearly, it's never the nuts here to anyone who knows how to play poker. But a lot of people will think, ooh, ace four, I have the best hand. I'm re-raising because I have a slow played trips on the flop. Not thinking that, you know, for, for hijack seat, meet or ace, I clearly have a very good hand, like I already said. And for button to cold call, they also very clearly have a good hand. Well, now you can't fold, right? So this is where, where I was going with the point is that if you know what your opponents do wrong, you can really adjust one way or the other. So if your opponent is going to raise the flop with any ace or king queen, then this becomes much more difficult. Now, you want to try to figure out how many worse hands are in the opponent's range in this spot, right? So say under the gun only has king queen or better. There's 16 combinations of king queen, all of which may play this way. But how many ace x are there? Well, it depends on if they're raising all ace x offsuits from under the gun, right? Probably they're not. So that means they have two combinations of the low ace x suited, so hearts and diamonds. So let's say they have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? So that's eight. So if they have a two to nine, that's 18 combinations of, or 16 combinations of ace x suited. But then they have ace jack. There are what, two of those. Then there are, um, what, one, two, two times three is six. My brain's not working today. Huh. Then there's um, six ace jacks, right? Then also pocket jacks. There's there's three of those. So you see, like, yes, there are more king queens, but in this scenario, if I call or jam, king queen may get the memo and not put in the rest of the money on the river, which, you know, would be quite a disaster for me. So... Even if the opponent's only re-raising king, queen, or better, I think this is a very close spot, especially given the player on the button could just have me crushed, right? So it's not such a good spot. But now if your opponent's going to re-raise ace nine and worse, and they have like ace, ace four offsuit in their range, well, then clearly we're never folding because now there's a whole load of combinations, right? So you always want to be asking, how many combinations of hands am I beating? And also, will my opponent actually play the hand in that manner? So in this scenario... What it breaks, boils down to is if the opponent will overvalue, I'm never folding. And I'm always calling because you want to call because if the opponent does happen to have a hand like ace four suited that's getting overplayed and I jam here, I go all in, now the opponent's going to have an easy fold. At least I would think they'd make an easy fold. Clearly, if they're a calling station, then you can jam and just get the money in against ace four. But most people aren't going to call it off once it goes 10, 30, call, 60, all in for 180 or whatever it is, right? That's not going to happen too often. So um, for that reason, I think you do want to call and just essentially trap your opponent. Also, if the opponent is prone to bluff, if they're a maniac, we also want to call because they're going to have a lot of draws like queen nine, which is dead, or eight, seven of clubs, which is dead, right? We really want to keep the opponent in when they're dead. And, you know, if the player on the button happens to have a beat, such is life. Now, if you're playing live poker again, and you can look and tell when it goes bet 10, call, and then the player on the button acts really funky and then calls, then, um, well, may maybe we need to start reading this player to be very, very strong and slow playing, right? In which case, now we're not even worried about this, this under-the-gun player so much. We're really worried about the button, who would just be trapping us. So, very, very tough spot. Ralph says, range-wise, this player should not open ace-track under the gun. Um, that, I mean, I'm raising ace-track under the gun every time in most games. Ace-jack's a great hand, especially if your opponents are a little bit too call-happy. So if your opponents are a little bit too call-happy, then you definitely want to raise ace-jack because they're going to be calling with ace-eight offsuit because they're not very good. As your opponents play more hands pre-flop poorly and in a passive manner, that allows you to raise more hands in general. You don't necessarily want to raise ace-jack if you're going to be getting three-bet a lot or your opponents are going to continue with strong ranges. Ralph says three-bet the tens. Definitely don't three-bet the tens pre-flop. That would be a big mistake. Especially, Ralph, if you think your opponents are opening with only ace, queen, and better, and what, pocket nines and better? You don't want to three-bet pocket tens against pocket nines and better and ace, queen, and better, right? That would be a big mistake because then they're never folding and you're going to be in bad shape against that range. You always want to ask, how does my hand play against the opponent's range, right? 
It's very, very important. And if you think the opponent's a nit under the gun, definitely don't three bet tens because then you're just piling money in poorly. Obviously, like I said earlier, if the opponent is raising with all sorts of junk, then three betting tens becomes a little bit better. Anyway, the person who sent me this email wanted a definitive answer. What do I do? Like, I can't tell you because you need to figure out what the opponents are doing wrong by paying attention. So anyway, um, if the opponent's a maniac, I would call here. If the opponent's even like an overvaluing player, I would call here. This player probably on the button had an ace or king queen and realized, oh my god, I'm dead. So they folded. Rivers of seven of clubs, under the gun goes all in. And here, I think we have a very easy call. This is not always going to be the case, but usually when you think the opponent's a little bit too aggressive and the some potential bluffs come in, this is a spot where I would definitely call it off every time. Because... Whenever you call the turn here, really, you're just not folding the river unless it's um, a jack or an ace, right? Every other river is, is perfectly fine. Um, so, easy call here. Obviously, a king or a queen are kind of rough because you can't really expect the opponent to be betting in that scenario with a straight anymore or just an ace. So maybe you're supposed to fold on a king or a queen as well. But this is just always a call. Once we get past the turn in this scenario... We need to find the call unless we're living in some weird world where the opponent will always check with an ace and never has a flush or better in their range when they bet. Again, that's not like something that is very specific. You're going to have a very difficult time knowing. But um, yeah, once once you get past the turn, you're just calling. What if this is early in our session and we have no notes on the opponent? Um, you always have notes on the opponent. And what do they look like? How are they speaking? How are they handling their chips? Do they seem like the person who's going to be overvaluing marginal made hands? I mean, if this is just like a, someone who seems to be a good, strong player based on your default read, you should be way more inclined to fold than if this player seems a little bit loose and is splashy. And this is where, you know, you have to make some judgments and um, reads that may not necessarily be accurate. And you have to be willing to put your money on the line for reads that are not going to be accurate. In a generic small stakes game, I would probably not fold just because I do think people overvalue in general. But... Like I said, if under the gun seems to be a tight player, doesn't seem to be putting many chips in the pot, then um, then you should probably just fold the turn. How do I take notes during live play? Read Jonathan, or go watch the video at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. Would I have re-raised preflop with 10s? No, never. I'm almost never re-raising 10s preflop against an under the gun raiser. Given the betting in this hand, wouldn't you always call the turn bet? No, absolutely not. When it goes, bet, raise, cold call, re-raise. This guy's range should literally be, even if he's a lunatic, an ace or better or a straight flush draw. That's as wide as it's going to get. Now, as tight as it's going to get is going to be ace, tenor, or pocket jacks or better, right? So if he has pocket jacks or better, we're dead. If we're dead, we have 0% equity. People get in their mind, oh, I have good pot odds. Not if you have 0% equity. You never have good pot odds if you have 0% equity. And I think we actually could be in this scenario. So what happened here, I don't think I input it, but our hero called on the river, this guy jammed, hero called, guy shows up with ace jack, and we lose. And hero's saying, oh, maybe I should have made a big fold on the river. Well, if you're going to make a big fold here, it needs to be on the turn. So this is a scenario where you have to be very aware of what your opponents are doing. And then the person emailed me back saying, yeah, they were actually playing pretty tight and they hadn't really put many chips in the pot. It's like, yeah. <laughs> They had the nuts. Not shocking, right? This is how people play when they have the nuts. What if under the gun has ace jack as he was the initial raiser? He did have ace jack and you lose. But listen, Nidin, you have to understand that sometimes you are going to lose, right? Like if this hand went differently, say it just went bet for 30, raised, uh, bet, bet 10, raise to 30, fold, re-raise, or fold and then all in, we're definitely not folding. Sometimes you just have to go broke, right? I mean, so many people think that they are supposed to sidestep scenarios they view as a setup or an unlucky spot. But like, look, you're supposed to go broke whenever you have a good hand against a reasonable opponent. That's just how life goes. You say, I was correct about this one. Well, realize correct and incorrect are irrelevant because this is a hypothetical example that someone emailed me. I mean, it was a real example, but it's hypothetical to me, right? And like I said, if this guy was a maniac, it's an easy no fold. It's an easy call down. But if this is a knit, it's an easy fold. So that's what you have to consider. 
Let's see. What note would I put on the opponent after seeing ace jack? Slow plays and then re raises small on the turn. Um, but really, that you don't really learn a ton about the opponent's strategies unless they use very odd bet sizes. And to be fair, re raise a 60 is kind of an odd bet size here. Um, but you learn a lot about your opponents when they show up with the bottom of their range. Because when they show up with the bottom of their range, that is when they have something that's like very, very interesting, right? Like imagine that guy showed up with 8 7 offsuit there. Well, then clearly we just learned a whole lot, right? But when he shows up with ace jack, you're like, yeah, obviously you slow play the nuts. That's how some people play. So anyway, that is an example of a spot that I just just reviewed today that is a good example of perhaps our hero knew what his opponent was doing wrong. Hero later told me he was playing too tightly, but he didn't do anything about it. He wasn't willing to make the big fold on the turn. And if you all have watched any of my content, you know I don't make big folds. <laughs> Very rarely am I making a big fold, but like right here, this is just a no-brainer easy fold with a full house, given the action, given... The little bit of a read we had, this player seems pretty tight and doesn't seem like they're trying to give their money away. So when you see a mistake, figure out what you can do to take advantage of that mistake. Matthew says, what did the villain do wrong? We have the read here that he plays too tightly. If he plays too tightly and too straightforwardly, when he re-raises the turn, his range shrinks to only the nuts. So what mistake did he make? He made the mistake of having a range that is significantly imbalanced. So we presume, right? I mean, for all we know, the guy does have plenty of bluffs. Maybe the guy does it with ace-king. I don't know. But given that read that I was given by the person who sent me this hand, I think that our opponent has a lot of super nut hands and not a whole lot of junk or marginal hands there. So the mistake they're making is having an imbalanced range. So when you see mistakes, figure out what you can do to take advantage of the mistake. I mean, some people think a mistake is when the opponent makes a really bad play with his specific hand, right? The opponent did not make a mistake with this specific hand in this scenario, but they made a mistake across the board in having a range that was imbalanced. But if you're playing against a world-class player, I would call and then call because world-class players are going to have some bluffs. Let's see. You think it's tougher to fold since he min-raised. Still a mistake since he's telegraphing that he has the nuts. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. You have to realize that pot odds are irrelevant when you are just dead. What do you mean by a cold call? A cold call is when someone puts in money after a bet and a raise without having money in the pot already. So on the turn, when it goes bet 10, raise to 30, the person who just put in 30, who did not already have 10 invested, that is a cold call. Is a villain a nit because of the small raise? No, the villain was a nit because our the person who sent me the hand told me the player played tightly. You have to realize, we're not just playing one hand at a time when we're playing poker. We are playing lots of hands, lots of situations, right? All right, so anyway, let's go forward to the next mistake that small stakes players are making. Not studying away from the table. If you only play poker, if you go to the, if your, your poker time is literally getting in the car, driving to the casino, or opening up your laptop and playing online, and then shutting it, ending your session and going home, don't expect to succeed at poker. You have to spend a decent amount of time away from the table working on your game. Now, to beat one to no limit, I don't think you actually need to spend all of that long working on your game as long as you are learning smart. Problem is most people don't learn smart. They load up someone playing a, a tournament on Twitch and they think, all right, I'm studying poker now. Then they, they have four beers and pass out on the couch, right? That is not studying poker. Studying poker is actively learning, working hard, taking notes, and running simulations on your own. There's a free program called Equilab you all can download that you need to be studying with to learn how ranges interact with each other. That is highly important. So, especially if you are struggling to win, as I know many of you are because you tell me, you should be spending most of your poker time studying. And again, I know people like to get in there and gamble, but gambling is not going to make you better at poker. And if it does make you better at poker, it'll be really, really slowly. You'll be much better off if you learn smart instead of hard. So you want to find someone who can pinpoint your flaws so that you can quickly correct them. This is where you can go about getting a coach, where you can study good training material, where you can post in forums, post on my Discord channel. If you're a poker coaching member, we have a Discord channel where I'm, I just replied to a few hands today before I got on this. And I'm happy to do that for my students. Next, mistake number four. This is a big one not 
fixing your leaks. Most players model their actions after the people around them. For example, one tune limit is a great example of this where someone will get bad beat and they'll throw a fit and act like a child. And turns out everybody does that or a lot of people do that in the small stakes games because they're copying what their opponents are doing. They think, oh, this is good normal behavior. Or, um, you know, people will raise the six big blinds pre-flop. Why? Because that's what everybody else does. They have to know what they're doing, right? Well, um, no, <laughs> they don't know what they're doing, right? Or they don't, they don't know what they're doing and you should not be modeling your play after them. If your opponents are not beating the small stakes cash games or small stakes tournaments or any game, really, why would you model your actions after them? It doesn't make any sense, right? So just because your opponents go on tilt and, and throw a fit does not mean that you have to. And you have to realize that sometimes you will win and sometimes you will lose. Like in that previous hand with those pocket tens, if your opponent is a maniac and you know this and they are getting in there blasting and fighting hard and they just show up with the ace jack there, you're going to lose. It's okay. You have to accept that, which leads to mistake number five. This may be the biggest mistake that a lot of small stake players make is that they do not keep an adequate bankroll. If you do not have an edge, first off, if you go and play a game and you are not a winning player, no amount of bankroll management will save you. No amount will make you profitable because you're losing. If you lose, you can't think, all right, I'm going to buy in for $100. And if I lose, I'm going to buy in for $200. And if I lose, I'm going to buy in for $400, et cetera, et cetera. That is definitely not, it's not a way to win. It's a way to just lose more money. And if you are playing with a short bankroll, realize you will usually go broke even if you have an edge. Someone asked me just the other day, if you had $1,000, where would you start playing? Would you start at one, two? And the answer is no. One, two is way too big for a $1,000 bankroll because you only have five buy-ins. You are going to go down five or 10 buy-ins at some point in your career. I mean, when I was playing five to no limit every day at Bellagio a few years ago, I'm trying to think my biggest downswing, I think was about $30,000. So 300 big blinds. And that wasn't even that bad of a downswing really. And this was with me playing with about a 12 big blind per hour win rate. So 120 bucks an hour, which is just a pretty big win rate. And I still went down 30K at one point in the, in the biggest downswing. And that's just part of it. So if you're playing one, two, that'd be like you going down $6,000. Is that right? 6,000? No, three, 3,000? My brain's not working. No, 6,000. That'd be like a $6,000 downswing at one, two. So that's normal. Get used to it. You have to understand that that is the variance you have to accept. Now, if you can replenish your bankroll because you have a job, maybe you have, I don't know, some, some money coming in every month, then uh, you need to keep a smaller bankroll. Yeah, three, apparently I, I misspoke. 300 big blinds at one, two is only 600, but 3,000 big blinds is the amount that I lost. So um, I think that's 6,000. $6,000 is a bank is a swing that you will have. Do you need 20 buy-ins to be properly bankrolled? Well, Blake, or no, Mike, Mike, because you asked this, here it is. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Go right there as soon as we are done with this webinar and read that. It's 20 pages long. Only about half of it's about cash games, but that will tell you the bankroll that you need for your game based on your win rate and the stakes in the game and how much variance you expect to have. If someone tells you, you need 20 buy-ins to play one to no limit. And they just give you that advice. Think about how bad of advice that must be because they don't know your win rate. They don't know how much variance you have in the game. They don't know, well, they don't know exactly how big the game plays, right? If you're playing one to no limit and it's actually one two with a $5 straddle, well, you're actually playing one two five now, right? So Realize it's not as easy as, oh, for 510, you need $10,000. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. And if you, again, poker is not a simple game. And, you know, bankroll management is essentially all math. But you, all, you want to make sure that you actually understand what you're doing and why. Which is why I wrote the bankroll Bible. It's completely free for you at jlpoker.com slash bankroll. So let me ask you all a question. I just went over the five biggest mistakes that small stakes cash game players make, which is not figuring out your opponent's strategies, not taking advantage of your opponent's mistakes, not studying away from the table, not fixing your leaks, and not keeping an adequate bankroll. So were these helpful? Did any of these actually help you? And what is your number one mistake? What are you doing wrong? 
feel free, type it in the question box. I'm, I am excited to know what you all are doing wrong, what all you need help with. And that's going to allow me to make better content for you. Daniel says, you don't study away from the table at all. Well, you're here today, so we're, we're taking the first step, right? 90% of all players will lose because of the bankroll issue. Yeah, that, that is exactly a, an issue that a lot of people have. They are not disciplined. You must have discipline to succeed at poker. A lot of think that you can just be loose and gambly and splashing all your money around. And to be fair, that might be the optimal strategy in your game. But if you look at the most maniacal players at poker who succeed, they actually keep way bigger bankrolls than the tight players. You may say, why is that? Don't they like to gamble? Well, no, they like playing with the biggest edge they possibly can, which implies very often pushing the boundaries, pushing the limits. And... That results in them having a huge amount of variance, right? Whenever you're pushing the limits, whenever you're having a lot of variance, that's going to result in you having big swings. So if you're going to have big swings, you have to keep a big bankroll, right? So understand that it's perfectly fine to play loose, aggressive, splashy poker if that is what makes the most sense in your game. But you better make sure you're adequately bankrolled and not just straight up gambling. Greg says, number one is your biggest mistake. Yeah, well, you have to figure out what your opponents are doing, right? You have to get out of your own head and think, what are my opponents doing and what can I do about it? So I realize, just by talking to you all here, that a lot of you are having issues with, with just these five mistakes, right? And I realize making you aware of these is very helpful, but I can only help you so much in this short time that we have together, which is why I put together my ultimate cash game bundle. So the ultimate cash game bundle has tons and tons of training content for you. We have the cash game masterclass. I just released this recently. And this explains to you everything you could possibly need to know to succeed at cash games, which I know all of you are working very hard to do. It's what Trent was working on. And I shared this cash game masterclass with him before I shared it with anyone else. And he's gone from being a break-even player at 1-2-1-3 and one, three, to winning $25 an hour at 1-2-1-3, and one, three, which is a heck of an improvement, right? Which is going to allow him, if he feels inclined, to quit his job that doesn't make as much money and move up and continuing to better his life. And at the end of the day, my goal is to help all of you have better lives. If you want to work hard and you want to study and you want to actually improve your life, the Cash Game Masterclass is for you. Mike says, an endorsement. Since, start, since taking the masterclass, you're up over a thousand big blinds in cash games. Very, very good. Good work. So we discuss all of these topics in the cash game masterclass. I have a section on the flop that I'm particularly proud of because it explains when to bet, when to check, and when you are betting, how much. And that is vitally important, really, if you think about it. What do you have to do in poker? Well, you just have to figure out when to bet and when to check and, and how much. Next. We have beating five, 10 cash games. In this webinar, I review 78 five, 10 no limit cash games that were played on live at the bike. These are live hands. And I purposely did not watch these hands ahead of time so that you see my honest first impression of everything as it's happening. So there are over three hours of me reviewing five, 10 games there. This is all part of the ultimate cash game bundle. You're also gonna get crushing small stakes cash games. This is a four hour course where I teach you, again, in depth, lots of topics relating to beating the small stakes cash games. So we discuss how to crush players of um, various types, right? Such as how to beat the tight passive players, how to beat the loose passive players. Remember, this was tip number one and two today is how, like what you do to adjust to beat these particular players because that really is the name of the game, especially when your opponents play poorly. Also in the bundle, we get the live one to no limit cash games where I go through 30 hands that I played at Borgata. When I was in the process of writing one of my books, I went and I sat at Borgata and played one to no limit, right? Because I'm going to be writing about small stakes cash games. I sure better know what I'm talking about. And over 15 hours, I won $650. It's a pretty solid win rate. What is that? That's a lot. I don't know, 40 bucks an hour or something? That's a solid win rate. <laughs> I probably ran a little bit hot, but um, I remember a few a few spots where I was just like picking up the free money. There are many spots where it would go limp, 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 and the limpers were all weak, and I would just raise kind of big with the hands that were not good enough to limp with, like Jack 3 offsuit, for example. 
and they would just all fold. And they would just give me 15 bucks, give me 15 bucks over and over. I would just scoop up free $15 pots because people were folding way too often. And if your opponents are folding way too often, you can crush them just by being aggressive, but also not giving it away whenever they happen to beat you, right? I mean, so many people get in their minds that if they're aggressive pre-flop, they just have to blast it off post-flop every single time. And that is absolutely not true. Next, in the Ultimate Cash Game Bundle, we have the Live at the Bike 3-Bet Home Game, where I review every hand from a 1-3 game I played with a lot of the best players in the world, including Jason Kuhn, Scott Clements, Jeff Gross, Kyle Julius, and more. So that's a 3-Bet Home Game. Also, we have another 5-10 No Limit Live at the Bike Cash Game that I reviewed, including uh, players Matt Salzberg, who's Player of the Year, Lily Coletto, who loves to gamble, Ebony Kenny, and more. So, as you see, this bundle's starting to get pretty big, right? And that's because I want to provide you a substantial amount of value so that you know everything you need to know to beat the cash games. Next, this is a topic I get asked about all the time. How do I play against limpers? Well, I teach you how to do that from all the positions. And I also teach you how to play against limpers who limp with various ranges, right? Because all limpers don't limp the same ranges. So many people think, all right, this player limped and I need to punish the limpers. So I'm just going to blindly raise. And that is an egregious mistake because all limpers don't limp with the same strategy. So you have to figure out what your opponents are doing wrong. Again, we have another comprehensive three-hour No Limit Hold'em cash game webinar where I discuss developing a sound strategy. Again, also discussing in depth how to ex how to exploit the players you are most likely to be against, and also just generic strategies for good fundamentally sound poker. Right? A lot of people think, all right, I'm going to maximally exploit my opponents, but you have to go back and understand that you need to make sure you play fundamentally sound. And if you don't play fundamentally sound, well, that, that's a problem. Next, a lot of you tell me that you play in games where people are really loose and really splashy and really, um, they're playing every pot, right? So I decided to find a Live at the Bike episode, a 5 to no limit, where players were playing like every pot. How do you play when people are playing any two cards, people ask me. Well, develop fundamentally sound ranges and put your money in good. Sticking with that same theme, how to beat wild games. How do you play when it's just raised, re-raised, all in? This was from a 1-3 game that took place at Stone's Gambling Hall. And at Stone's Gambling Hall, they love to gamble. <laughs> and I will teach you how to play against these players who literally played almost any two cards. And you see this image right here, right? <laughs> we, we have like a, a seven-way raise pot or whatever it is. And that's just how it, how it happens at Stone's Gambling Hall. And I discuss how to beat those players. Finally, this last course we added to the cash, the Ultimate Cash Game Bundle is not taught by me, but it's taught by my student, just GTO, who is a very good six max player. As you see, he's played about 90,000 hands, winning about $16 per 100 hands at the small stakes online. And uh, well, if you want a graph of what your results look like, this is about the most beautiful graph you can ask for, right? It just goes straight up. There's like no downswings here. That's nice. <laughs> most people are gonna have um, slightly rougher swings than that. But um, this is nice. This is exactly what you want your graph to look like. And the great thing is, is like when you're talking about over 90,000 hands, he's clearly just crushing it, right? Like even if he's ran a little bit hot, it's not going to be super hot. Maybe he's actually winning $12 per 100 hands or something like that. But anyway, my student, just teach GTO, I asked him to make this course for me. It is on how to beat online six-handed cash games where he had those great results. And this discuss, discusses GTO preflop strategies in-depth game theory analysis of single raise pots, three bet pots, and four bet pots, and interactive hand reviews using the game theory optimal solvers. So here's what you're going to get as part of the cash or as, as part of the um, ultimate cash game bundle. You're going to get the cash game masterclass, beating five, 10 cash games, crushing small six cash games, my live one to no limit cash game webinar, the live at the bike with me, combating limpers, the three bet home game, also live no limit cash game webinar, how to beat wild games, how to beat six max, and how to beat six max online games. That's a lot of stuff. Goodness gracious. So total value of this, $2,121. But obviously I'm not going to charge you $2,121, which is what you'd pay if you just wanted to buy these individually, even though, you know, to be fair, it is definitely worth that for over 38 hours of training. So 
Let me ask you a question real quick. What if all this did was give you an edge over your opponents who do not work on their game away from the table? What would that be worth? Think about all your opponents who, like I said, they go and they watch Twitch streams and have a beer and then pass out. What if that's their poker study? And what if your poker study is learning from players who have succeeded at the games long term? What is that worth? What if all it did was just help you eliminate one leak from your game? For example, let's just say that you stop calling from the small blind with marginal stuff because you think, oh, I'm getting good odds, but not realizing you're going to have a really difficult time realizing your equity. Well, what's that worth? That's worth a ton because you make that mistake every single time you're in the small blind. What if all this did was help you book one extra winning session each month? For the next six months and beyond, like let's say you normally win, your winning sessions are only $100. You do that for six months. Well, that's worth at least 600 bucks and you're going to take that money. You're going to continue grinding it up for forever. By the way, one of the best things you can purchase for yourself is education and information if you are willing to work hard to apply it to you because, well, that money that you invest compounds over time. So... Here is what I have for you today. You're gonna to get the whole Ultimate Cash Game Bundle, but instead of for $2,121, you can go to pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle right now, use the coupon code cash, and get it all for $99, which, you know, if you're playing one to no limit or higher, you're gonna make or lose, you know, $100 in every session, uh, pretty much like clockwork, because that's just how poker goes. And... We have tons of students who've already been through this masterclass who, have, or who are seeing significantly better results because they were willing to do the work, they were willing to study, and now they're making tons of money, like Trent said right at the top of this video. This video, this is a webinar. Here, we're here live. <laughs> so you have four choices. Option one, do nothing. Keep watching your Twitch streams and passing out. You can show up and play your best and continue to get the same results you've been getting, which, you know, to be fair, is fine if you don't want to improve your game, and that's what you want. Option two, you can hire me for private coaching for $500 an hour. I'm pretty much fully booked, but it's an absolute value if you are going to improve significantly at poker, which my students do because I'm sitting there in real time telling them how to fix the problems that they have. I have spent over $25,000 for private coaching, and I can tell you it was worth every single penny. Kind of like, you know, when you go to college. College is pretty much overpriced, for most people, but like when you go to college, you're paying so that you have a long profitable future. I loaded up on private coaching and training sites and books whenever I was young and it's been well worth it. So that's option two, 500 bucks an hour. I realize that's out of the reach of almost everyone. Option three, you can try the ultimate cash game bundle for $99 risk-free for 30 days and you'll get over 38 hours of training to help you crush the games up to 5, 10, no limit. And if you don't love it, I don't want your money. Just ask for a refund. But there is a fourth option. And if you're considering getting the Ultimate Cash Game Bundle, it's really the only option that makes sense. You can sign up for Poker Coaching Premium. That is my training site that gives you access to the Ultimate Cash Game Bundle, everything I just mentioned, for free. It's part of Poker Coaching Premium. You also get the Ultimate World Series Bundle, the Ultimate Main Event Final Table Bundle, where I go through lots of World Series Main Event action and pick up things players were doing great, pick up things they were doing poorly. Also, you get access to the Excelling at No Limit Hold'em 14 Webinar Bundle that I produced and presented with many of the best players in the world. You see them all over here. I asked them to present about what they are experts in. We have um, World's, uh, Phil Helmuth breaking down World Series of Poker Hands. We have Olivier Bousquet discussing heads-up strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And recently, I reviewed a bunch of hands from the Triton Million Pound Tournament just a few weeks ago. And it's there, also in premium. All of these training courses are free in Poker Coaching Premium. You can go there and sign up at pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle. So we have a few people who are always asking, what is Poker Coaching Premium? Well, in addition to all of those webinars and classes, you get instant access to over 500 interactive hand quizzes. These are like me sitting over your shoulder while you are playing. Again, remember how I mentioned a lot of people just want to go and play? Well, I figured out a way to teach you while you play. So there are over 500 of those. There are over 150 video classes. 
There are 14 challenge webinars where I put you in a tricky spot. I ask you how you would play your whole range in a specific scenario. Pre-flop, on the flop, on the turn, and on the river, if we get that far, depending on stack sizes. And that is highly important. Also, we have pre-flop range charts for 100 big blinds, 25 big blinds, 15 big blinds. These are implementable GTO charts that I use in the highest stakes tournaments while I'm playing and in cash games because you need to know the correct ranges. If you're starting off with the wrong ranges, well, sorry, you're going to have a tough time winning. Members also get two live coaching webinars every month, kind of like this one. Also, they get two video classes added every month. They get one live challenge webinar every month and at least 15 new hand quizzes uploaded every month. It's just what you get is being a poker coaching member. So you can get all 124 hours of the free training, all included in part of Poker Coaching Premium. You can get that at pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle. And we're constantly uploading many, many new quizzes in uh, the cash game format, right? I I've listened to all of you. You say you all need, we want more cash game quizzes. We've hired a new cash game coach we'll be announcing in the near, fu near future. And also, Matt Affleck plays 5, 10, and 10, 20, no limit just for a living. That's what he does. And we have great quizzes by him. I learn something every time I do it. As you see, total value for all of this is $4,678. But you can get all of these for just $99 a month if you go to pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle. As you see, here's where, where you will go to access the courses and the bundles. You see the Cash Game Masterclass right here. So you go to, on the dashboard, you click on classes. It'll be right here for you, waiting for you as soon as you sign up. So I want to clear up some confusion about the offer. You can either get the ultimate cash game bundle for $99, which are all of these things here in yellow. Or you can join Poker Coaching Premium and get the ultimate cash game bundle for free. And as long as you don't request a refund from Poker Coaching Premium in the first month, you get to keep the cash game bundle forever. You get to download it, you get to keep it, and it's yours. So it's just like buying the bundle for $99, but you get access to Poker Coaching Premium and all the other bonus training content on this slide inside the Poker Coaching Premium premium section. So if you're thinking about getting the ultimate cash game bundle, I highly recommend you get poker coaching premium and try it for free. I like giving away free rolls and this is just about as free as it can get. So that way you can own the cash game bundle forever and to try poker coaching premium for free for 30 days and get access to all of the bonus training. And if you love it, stay in as long as you're getting value from it. And if you don't just send us an email and uh, you will never be billed again. James says, Poker Coaching Premium is so worth it. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Here's something Mike said just recently. The Cash Game Masterclass was awesome. Since joining Poker Coaching Premium, you've gone from six big blinds per hour last year at 2.5 to over 13 big blinds per hour at 2.5. That's fantastic. Good job, good work. So here's what you're going to get, as you see, on the left-hand side of the screen for the Cash Game Bundle. All of that is there but you can get this bundle completely for free when you join Poker Coaching Premium, which you can do right now at pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle. So I know a lot of you are gonna be doing that right now, but first we're gonna answer some of your questions before we wrap it up for today. Let's see, if you're currently a Poker Coaching Premium member, can you, or Poker Coaching member, can you move up to premium? And then if you wanna move back, can you move back? You certainly can. That is absolutely correct. Oliver says, premium is nuts. <laughs> it, it is the nuts. It is the super nuts. Look, whenever I make educational content, I always ask either, what do I want right now in my life? In which case, most recently we've had um, Fedor Holtz doing some webinars with us. He's one of the best players in the world. I want to learn from Fedor, so I get him to make content for us. Also, Jonathan Jaffe, I think he's one of the best players in the world. I We, we did a webinar just the other day, and he's going to be making more content for you. Also, I think, what would past Jonathan Little want? Well, he wants lots of solid fundamentals. He wants to know how to not make mistakes on a regular basis. And we have all the content there for that as well. Luck, I'm not sure what you're asking me. So please, please reiterate the question. If you ever have any questions, by the way, about poker coaching or poker coaching premium, just send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com. We are happy to address any questions that you have. You play online 
Your small winner, 25 no limit. Would the cash game bundle help you improve your game? Absolutely. In terms of what stakes online it'll help you up to? Depends on what site you're playing on, really. Also depends on if you're playing Zoom games or not. But in general, um, probably 50 cent dollar, maybe even a little bit higher. You have to understand that online games are way tougher than live games for the most part. And um, therefore, you know, the medium stakes start around one, 50 cent dollar to one, two. And um, so anyway, that's basically it. If you're playing 25 no limit, that is uh, 10 cent, 25 cent no limit. These will def definitely be applicable for you. If you miss this webinar, will there be a replay? There absolutely will. If you get the bundle for 30 days, does it disappear after 30 days? You can't get through all of it in 30 days. Well, if you sign up for Poker Coaching Premium, like we show over here, here, all the things in yellow are what you will get forever, assuming you do not cancel within the first 30 days. So that's the, all that stuff you just get. Like I said, it's basically like you're buying Poker Coaching Premium, or you're buying a... You're buying Poker Coaching Premium, you're just getting all of the things in yellow completely for free for forever. The stuff that's not in yellow, you have to stay a member of Poker Coaching Premium to access. That said, if you're even spending an hour or two each month or each week, imagine you're spending, let's just say four hours a week learning from myself and many of the other best players in the world we have listed here. Is it worth $25 an hour to learn from the best poker players in the world? I mean, I think it is. And then say you spend um, 10 hours a week or 10 hours a month, 10 hours a month, two and a half hours a week, not all that much time, right? Learning from the best players in the world, well, $10 an hour. If you don't think it's worth $10 an hour to learn from the best players in the world, well, you may be in the wrong webinar because that is an absolute steal. Like I discussed earlier, I've spent over $25,000 on poker coaching myself, learning from others, and uh, I, I wish I would have spent more. Can we know how to play every situation correctly? Oliver, we can certainly give you a good fundamentally sound strategy that will help you know how to navigate most scenarios very, very well. Certainly there are going to be corner cases that are difficult to analyze in terms of, um, you know, figuring it out on the fly, but that's why you, you spend ahead of time. Spend, spend time ahead of time learning about those scenarios. When should you end a losing session? Whenever you feel like it, <laughs> right? I mean, what I would always do is I would just play a set number of hours. Whenever I was starting to play poker, I would play from roughly noon till midnight every day, probably not the optimal hours, but they, that works for me. And I would quit either if I got down when I was playing five, 10, $4,500. So that'd be like $900 at one, two, or when I, I'm oh, sorry, $8,500. It, wait, how much is this? $900. Yeah. $900 at one, two, or, um, whenever I played my full 12 hours, Mike says, quit and you recognize your tilting, you know, one thing I've learned is I have learned to just play better and better poker is I don't really go on tilt because I know I am making a decision that is either the right play or the second best play. And that is highly valuable, right? Whenever you don't know what you're doing, that's when people typically get annoyed and go on tilt because they don't understand the variance. They don't understand math. And they also don't know what a fundamentally sound strategy is. And... We'll teach you all that at pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle. If you want to play micro stakes, where your average profit is uh, $5.47, $5.47 over a bunch of tournaments, and you want to play some small stakes cash games. Hmm, not sure what your question is here. But yeah, uh, cash games are online are a great way to get practice and experience for the smaller stakes games. Let's see. We're going to get on the Discord. Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we will get that to you. How much of a bankroll do you need? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. We discussed that earlier. Your poker coaching member and want to upgrade because the content is great. Where can you upgrade? Go to, or send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we will get that upgrade link for you. There should also be an upgrade link in pokercoaching.com. How do you defend against people who over-defend their straddle? Just play stronger hands, right? And realize that they're going to have a range that's much too wide after the flop. So if you know your opponents are defending too wide from the straddle, that means they have a lot of junk. If they have a lot of junk, then you want to ask, are they going to be playing aggressively after the flop? If they're going to be getting in there, raising and re-raising, well, then just play hands and make top pair and don't fold. If they're going to be too nitty after the flop because they have a lot of garbage and they don't want to check call from out of position or check raise with nine high, well, then you can just raise a continuation bet a lot.
Would the cash game bundle be helpful for a sit-and-go player? Well, if you're going to play cash games, it certainly will. And I definitely think the cash game masterclass in particular will be very, very valuable in helping you learn to play fundamentally sound poker, which is highly valuable. Highly, highly valuable. Because then you just don't make big mistakes. Like imagine you would just never make a big mistake again because you understand how to play poker well, right? I mean, what is that worth? Think about how many times you, you leave the poker table thinking, oh man, I screwed that up. Not just because they showed up with the nuts or whatever, but because you made a mistake or made an error. And if you just never did that again, that's worth a ton. Why would someone play more cash than tournaments? You find that you win more playing cash than tournaments, but you enjoy tournaments more. What do I recommend? I recommend doing whatever makes you happy, especially as long as you are not actively trying to become a poker pro. You will find that cash games allow you to play more hours because if you go, let's say you could travel to play a poker tournament, but you only last for three hours and then you bust and you're done. Well, that's unfortunate. Now you have to go home. Whereas in cash games, if you bust after three hours, you can re-enter or rebuy, you know, get more money in front of you. And then you just get to continue putting in hours in a profitable game. So um, also cash games have way less variance, right? In tournaments, you either lose a little or win a ton. Whereas in cash games, you usually win, you know, some or lose some minus a little bit, which means, well, I guess some plus a little bit, whatever it is. You, you basically, whenever you're, you're going to have a much more steady graph, kind of like just GTO's graph earlier that I showed you that was pretty much straight up. That is what a good live or a good cash game player's graph will look like. And that's just GTO playing in relatively tough online games. Which card room is best for America? American players. See jonathanlittlepoker.com slash USA. Completely thrown out, no set, no bet <laughs> that you've been, you've completely thrown out that strategy you've been using. Yeah, don't be a weak tight knit. If you're a weak tight knit, do not expect to win. You expect to blind out. When's the correct time to move up in stakes? Typically, you want to have the proper bankroll for the next higher stake. Also, you want to realize that you may, be not, may not be skilled enough to play the higher stake, but I'm a pretty big fan of pushing up as hard as you realistically can without risking your bankroll. Again, go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Read that, and I discuss taking shots and moving up. Does, G does just GTO have more content on PokerCoaching.com? Not yes, but um, not yet. But he will be making more in the future with any luck. So if you like it, send us an email, support at PokerCoaching.com, and I will tell him. When you're playing poker online, should you look up your opponents on the various sites and um, take a look at their their stats? Yes, you absolutely should. Use all information you can. If you mostly play Zoom cash games, you have or you play mostly Zoom cash games, and you have no reads. What should you do? Bogdan, you should just play good, fundamentally sound poker. If you have no reads on your opponents, just play well. That said, I generally recommend people not play Zoom because Zoom games tend to be pretty tough. And you don't want to play in tough games, assuming you are trying to make the most money possible. When you hit the flop, you get excited and you don't account for the hand ranges. Last week you had Jack-9 on 10-8-7. You got excited and started putting money in, but you lost to a flush. Well, if there's a flush, if there's three to a flush on jack eight or 10, eight, seven, and your opponents are trying to blast their money in, then, well, you need to be careful, right? Because quite often you could be in bad shape. Let's see. You have a problem overvaluing marginal made hands. Yeah. You're saying that you expect people to fold marginal made hands if you bet. Well, not exactly sure how those two are related, but if you overplay your marginal made hands like top pair marginal kicker, realize that's a problem. Whenever you go bet, bet, jam with top pair marginal kicker, what's really going to call you, right? Not a whole lot. And if not a whole lot's going to call you, well, then maybe you're making a mistake. You have trouble adjusting to games against loose, aggressive players. Well, just play fundamentally sound ranges. I feel like a broken record saying this over and over. If you are having a hard time playing against players who are applying aggression to you, you're probably playing too many hands, or you're just playing way too weakly and way too passively. And if, uh, well, that's you, you need to cut that out immediately. You have to get in there and you have to play fundamentally sound ranges, and you have to adjust to what your opponents are doing. And if they're raising and re-raising, just start trapping them a lot. Lux says we have a new poker coaching premium member. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate it. Hope you learn a ton. And again, if you don't learn a ton... 
cancel and get a refund because if I am not adding a significant amount of value to you and your poker strategy, I don't want your money. <laughs> I want to help people who are going to work hard and improve their game. And I know, Luck, that you are going to get in there and work hard and do it. You play 3,000 hands a week online with a steady return on investment, but you can't face the local casino. Any advice for transitioning from live to online? Well, realize the games are different, right? This is a situation where you have to understand that you may be playing a little bit too loose aggressive. You may be calling too much. I don't know. Again, you want to ask what you are doing incorrectly, right? You want to figure out what you're doing wrong. And if you don't know what you're doing wrong, you need to go and you need to study. I mean, in this cash game, in the ultimate cash game bundle, you see we have tons of hand history reviews because it's not necessarily that I want you to learn how this player's making mistakes and needs to get better, but I want you to watch these hand history reviews because you're going to see players making the same plays you make. And then my feedback is, wow, this is a really bad play. And if you are making really bad plays, you need to learn to fix them. What's a good bankroll tracking software Bankroll tracking software option. I just use Excel. Excel works for me. I know there are some various applications on the phones, but I always just use Excel at this point. The problem I've had with some phone apps is that it'll be working and then they'll just stop updating the app because no one's buying the app. And then next thing you know, you have all your data and something that's irrelevant. So I think Excel is going to stick around for a while. So I'm going to do that. Where should you start in premium? If you have not watched the Cast Game Masterclass, go do that first. Let me show you where to go. On the dashboard, click on classes right here, and then go over here to Cash Game Masterclass. That is exactly where you should go. And as you see, all of these um, these categories here are courses and um, classes on very specific topics. If you have, well, as you see adjustments here, I'm going to be talking about how to play against specific types of players. That's um, highly valuable, right? We basically have all of these resources available for you. Bluffing is harder live. You need to practice that. When you say harder, it just means you're probably not biologically conditioned to run bluffs and be comfortable with that. And yeah, you have to get in there and you have to practice. But also, you have to know that the bluff you are making is a good, fundamentally sound bluff or a good exploitative bluff because you think your opponent's going to fold too much. And if your play is good, just be happy making good plays, right? Which would be the best to help you improve your preflop game? Alex, just check out the, uh, the charts in Poker Coaching Premium. Those will be very helpful. Let's see. How do you handle players who call any amount with any suited cards and they love flushes? Play good fundamentally sound ranges. Again, that, that really is the answer to a lot of these questions you're asking. How do you play against someone who's making a big mistake? Play fundamentally sound ranges and then adjust them slightly. So how would you adjust against someone who calls with any two premium card or any two suited cards? Just raise with better hands, right? Stop playing so many marginal hands. Stop trying to bluff so much against your calling station opponent. And um, just play better cards than they're playing. I mean, th that's the nice thing about small stakes games is that really all you have to do to win is just play better cards than your opponents and then get off the hook whenever it becomes very clear that they like their hand. When reviewing your hand, should you run all the ranges in Flopzilla? I don't think that's necessarily required. Um, you have to ask, what, why am I running it through Flopzilla, right? If you're running it, Flopzilla is a very good program to help you find out how much fold equity you have, which maybe you don't even care about. I mean, like in small stakes games, right? Quite often, you're not even so concerned with fold equity. You're more so concerned with just getting money in way ahead. Let's see. You play with too little aggression and you don't believe your opponents have strong hands. Well... You have to start listening to what they're telling you, right? Sometimes people are going to be very face up. And if they're very face up, that's when you actually get to get off the hook. If, now, when you're playing against good opponents who are not so face up, like with that pocket tens hand earlier, sorry, you're just losing your money. <laughs> but if your opponents are very nitty and straightforward, you get to get off the hook. All right. If you don't learn, you're not a good student. At this moment, you play one, two Euro cash games, total of 450 hours this year. So far, I guess you're up 2,900 euros. Good job. Good work. Keep it up. You hope to boost your euros per hour. Yeah, that, that's really the goal, right? You want to increase your win rate to the point that you can build your bankroll quickly, move up, and continue crushing. Do I recommend playing cash games on Party Poker? I mean, sure. I'm, I'm fine with any of the reputable sites. Ideally, you want to play in games with low rake. I know Party Poker doesn't have such an egregious rake. So uh, yeah, sure. Party Poker is a great site to play on. 
So that's all the questions you all asked. Again, if you have not already, head over to pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle right now to get access to the cat the ultimate cash game bundle including the cash game masterclass and also sign up for poker coaching premium that way you get the cash the ultimate cash game bundle for free it's just part of poker coaching premium and you get access to all of those other resources i made pokercoaching.com to be the resource i want and the resource i wish i had when i was learning to play poker and um, all of the students there are telling me that's exactly what it is which was my goal so i'm glad that i've made this and we're continuing to add to it every single month. We add lots and lots of new content because I know my best students are consuming all of my content. They're going through it, they're learning, and they're improving their skills. And I want to continue helping them improve their skills on a very regular basis. So head over to pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle now and sign up. So that's me it for today. Thank you all very much for your questions. Thank you for being here. Good luck in your games. Have a great week. And I'll talk to you next time.